All right. Wow. A lot of people here. So I'm, I'm between you and lunch, so hope to make this very interesting. <laughs> and uh, when I was coming to stage, I was actually debating if I should bring paper or not. Uh, and I would go paperless to talk about serverless and bring a device. I was like, no, well, I'll bring paper and keep it very low tech because it works. Uh, so I'd like to start by introducing our panelists. And of course, thank you for joining us. But actually, before I start, uh, before the, the, the keynote here when Chris talked about Knative, how many of you here have heard about Knative before today? Wow. OK. How many of you are running Knative? OK. What about Istio? OK. So we'll. Heard of or running? Yeah, I, I thought you were, I was asking about right, production, like you're running it, but that's, we'll, we'll dive more into that. So let's start by introducing our panelists, right? So please go ahead. OK. So my name is um, Klaus Deisner. I work for SAP. And um, yeah, I'm an architect there and working on uh, our functions as a service offering. And also, about a year ago, I think, I joined the serverless working group at CNCF. So we are doing cloud events. I'm Paul Mori. I'm an engineer who frequently puts his mouth too close to the microphone. Uh, but I work on different parts of the Kubernetes ecosystem at Red Hat. And I'm leading our uh, Knative efforts at Red Hat. Hi, so my name is Edith Levine. I'm the founder and the CEO of a company called Solo.io. It's a small company we just launched today, so it's a special day for us. Uh, what we're doing, uh, so, so we've been playing a lot of trying to bring everything that's related to serverless and microservices together to their legacy application. So kind of like glue them together. Uh, so yeah, that's what we're doing. So we're working a lot with serverless, the, in the cloud, Knative, everything that there is. Uh, Doug Davis, IBM, um, CTO, developer advocacy for containers, and also the lead liaison between the open source communities and IBM. Also the co-chair of the uh, serverless working group and the cloud events working group, which those two guys over there are part of. Mark Schwarney, I'm technical program manager at Google, working on serverless, uh, working also on a Knative project. All right. Uh, great. So I'll start by asking, I'd say, the, the most important question, I think, which is, so Kubernetes, Istio, and Knative, or, or Kik, is it the new cloud stack, or is it a yak, and we are just yet another cloud stack, and we are here just shaving yaks again. So let's start with that first. Since you've got the mic, I'm going to start with you for now. <laughs> well, I think if anybody knew the answer to that question, we probably wouldn't necessarily need to have the panel, right, for one reason or another. Um, I tend to think of these things like the, uh, the great adage, if you build it, they will come. So for example, uh, back when the, the concept of uh, a easily extending Kubernetes with new APIs was like a glimmer in a couple of folks' eyes, I don't think anybody could anticipate the extent to which uh, custom resource definitions and all of the attached concepts like operators, Kubernetes native applications, et cetera, would affect uh, our ecosystem and community in the way that they have. So. Um, we, we won't know unless we continue to build it. Uh, and since we will build it, we want it to be the best thing that it can be. Uh, but I personally think there's a huge amount of potential uh, to affect things in a very significant way. Just my two cents. I can jump in here. Um, I think we also have a lot of signal already from the community with the adoption of Kubernetes itself. I, I saw some numbers today that we're growing to something to the tune of 250 to 300 percent year over year on the amount of jobs related to Kubernetes that are advertised or people looking for somebody who have those skills. Um, and, and the role that uh, Istio and Kubernetes and Knative play uh, kind of on top of that platform. Uh, underscores kind of the, the, the signals that we're getting from community that people are already invested in Kubernetes and uh, want to have uh, the new usage patterns like serverless being addressed on that platform. So uh, using uh, Knative and, and Istio to kind of fill the gaps around, Knative, uh, around Kubernetes and solve for those problems. 
Uh, so we're talking about stack, right? So let's kind of like separate the stack. The first one is Kubernetes. I think this is ends down, there is a winner, right? It's Kubernetes, right. we all agree about it, there's no question about that anymore. So now we're talking about STL. And STL is interesting. So what we do know is that service mesh is here to stay. That's something that we definitely know. Is STL will be the winner? It's a good question, but right now there is a lot of people that, you know, a lot of new services offer out there, right? AppMesh was from AWS last week. So if you're running on AWS, it's free. You most likely will want to use that, right? So you will not be going to use uh, STL. There is stuff like console connect in the on-prem that could be interesting. So I think there is, there is no definition. This is, for instance, why we actually created Superglue recently, which is exactly that. It's an abstraction layer for all the service mesh. Okay, so that's that. Now we're talking about KNF, so that's even more interesting. Because is serverless is even makes sense on-prem? That's a good question, right? I mean, it definitely makes sense for the cloud, and the reason it is is because, you know, it's work much better on rent, when you're renting stuff, you're paying for only what you're using. The question if it makes sense on-prem, and that's a good question. But what I do like about service, a, a K-Native is the packaging, right? It's the past experience, and I think that's here to stay. So, we will Nice, see. nice. Yes. Want to add to that, Doug? No, actually, she stole my thunder. I, I agree. I think Kubernetes is the de facto sort of standard everybody's using, and that's great, until the next big thing comes along. Um, Istio is interesting, but it's, it's more for the, the ops guy to get to understand and wrap their head around. It's just it's, it's more complicated. How does it interact with the routing that's native inside Kubernetes already? But Knative is where I'm more excited by because that hits the end user, and that's where you, I'm wanting want the end users to actually live, not with the rest of the stuff. And so I think you had the two extremes are the most interesting to me. The core infrastructure, which we're building on Kubernetes, and then the user experience, which is Knative. Istio, cool technology and great functionality, but I'm more interested in the other two ends. Nice. Can I add to that, Klaus? Yeah, so we, we had it in the previous talks. Application development teams don't want to care too much about servers, so um, that was already what it is all about. And um, yeah, we are also running our applications on different cloud providers, and so it's, it's really convenient that Kubernetes is offered by all of them. Yeah, so dive more into that then. Uh, we talked a lot about Istio and service meshes, but why, why do we need service meshes for, for serverless? Or why is it important to have a service mesh when I'm doing serverless? How does that help serverless workloads? So, um, so there's three use case, main use case today for service mesh. The first one is observability. I guess that's very clear why we need it for serverless. Right. The other one is routing. Again, we probably need to route to a function, specifically if we want to run between microservices and serverless or something like that, it's kind of like heterogeneous environment. And the last one is, uh, is uh, security. Again, I think it's no brainer why we need that. So from all those, that reason, I mean, it just makes a lot of sense. OK. Want to add to that, Mark? No, I was just going to say to bring it, maybe make it a little more real, because I think those three categories are exactly spot on. But you know, if anybody has ever written more than you know, five to 10 microservices, you quickly realize that uh, the problems you've had uh, with two or three was probably not uh, something you were worried about. Suddenly, you have things that are connecting to each other and getting calls from outside, logging to places. Uh, so, so all those things we talked about, observability, uh, control, uh, control access, or, or being able to kind of uh, define the, the paths and patterns is, is critical. Uh, so Istio, I agree, is to, to a large degree not the end user developer kind of uh, experience that we want to expose in the core, but it serves a very critical and important uh, role in the entire serverless stack. So, um, yeah, with an environment uh, where developers do not need to care about servers so much, maybe they shouldn't care too much about failing servers. So, um, resilience is also an important aspect if you, um, for example, provide a function as a service. Um, with Istio, developers do not have to bake that into their applications, but it can be provided also by the infrastructure. Yeah, for me, it's all about the, the abstraction. All the, the categories you laid out are exactly right, and people have been doing that for a long time, but the problem is they had to do it themselves. If we can do that for them and then expose it in a really cool way through something like Knative so they don't have to see all the guts and glory unless they really need to, that's where I think the end goal is. Have the service mesh, but expose in a user-friendly way. Yeah, this is actually... I think we're touching on one of the most salient parts of the value proposition of Knative, which is that um, the, the end goal is that 
you get to focus on the things that are important to you and focus on your value add without having to become an expert in the underlying technologies necessarily. So for me, I will just, full disclosure, I'm not an Istio expert, but I've been able to get Knative to do things for me with Istio, and in doing so, I actually didn't have to learn a whole lot about Istio and was able to leverage it. That's the kind of like force multiplication effect uh, that I think is really key to the value that Knative provides. That you can stand on the shoulders of people who, I can't speak for anybody else, but are definitely smarter than me, uh, that have figured out how to make uh, these things work together and harness it without doing the work yourself. Okay, so changing topics a little bit, talking maybe about something a little bit more uh, polemic maybe, but uh, vendor lock-in for serverless in particular. Should we be concerned, like is that a real thing that we should be concerned about lock-in and serverless workloads and function as a service? <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. Uh, so I think that usually the computer is not really interesting, right? Why are you running a function? It doesn't matter, let's run it somewhere else. So that's not really a problem. A real problem is the data. And the data is there, right? There's nothing we can do. So, so that's the real problem that we need to solve in, in terms of um, in vendor locking. The only thing that I will say is that um, with the new, um, you know, buzzword, multi-cloud, when everybody talking about it, I think that good could help because theoretically what it could cause is that let's say that all my storage right now is in AWS, the only thing that I need is to run one little function whenever I need this data. But all the rest of my workload can run all over the cloud, you know, wherever I need it. And I think that could be interesting for instance, even in, you know, I think that could be very, very interesting. Okay. So obviously being part of the Cloud Event Working Group, obviously standards and cloud events is important to us. Um, from an interoperability perspective, obviously everybody wants interoperability, portability, all the other stuff, but I think you have to put it in context, right? It's not uh, a showstopper for most people. It's a, it's a pain in the butt, it's a hindrance to, to, to port your stuff over to another platform, but most people aren't gonna be moving their, their, their workloads to whatever platforms every other day, right? It's not the kind of thing you do, because it's, it's, it's the, the, the function signatures or whatever are just one part of the entire equation. It's the functionality, it's the performance, everything else is good. There are lots of other things to lock you in, and interoperability and portability is one of them, so you just need to put it in the context with everything else. So interoperability is important, but do it at the right time, at the right scale, and at the right spots. Um, you don't want to necessarily do everything because then you're going to maybe lock down too much too quickly, but I think we'll get there eventually and customers will demand it, but we've got to do it at the right place and time. Um, nobody said it, so I'm going to say it. I, I think developers, when they write applications, don't... Um, strive for writing for the minimum amount of people, right? Everybody, whoever wrote an application wants to write for the largest amount audience that is possible. So the utopia of a portable workload that, that just magically works on every single cloud uh, is something that we strive for. Obviously, it's not reality today. Um, so I think it's probably important to break that, that kind of fear of locking into smaller chunks and kind of understand what does it mean with regards to the actual runtime. Uh, definition and uh, enabling at least the, the, the application to be portable. Uh, what does it mean with regards to a control plane where uh, the way we interact with the APIs and the, uh, the runtime application. Um, so in principle, locking probably not something we strive for and nobody wants that, but uh, I think the problem is probably more nuanced than just saying it's, it's either bad or good. Maybe just um, adding to what Doug said, um, and also you. So I like that point about the data, where the data is. But at least with the eventing, you can uh, be notified when something happened to your data and act upon it uh, somewhere else. Right, so diving more into that, because uh, we, we are talking a lot about hybrid, hybrid cloud and hybrid serverless now. And specifically about serverless, I would say, and function as a service, we are starting to see more and more moving to the edge, on-prem, on multi-cloud. So hybrid serverless, like, is that, is that real? Or are we coming up with this yet another buzzword? Like, is that a real need that you already see in the market or from customers to do hybrid serverless? And can you talk more about that? I, 
I have a strong gut feeling that hybrid serverless is a real thing. So, I mean, in going back to the last beat of this panel, uh, Doug, I think you made the point that like, there is, uh, that lock-in is only a problem when you want to move, right? And um, there, I think there are a cluster of uh, use cases that speak to that, but then there are also uh, reasons that people seek diversity in their cloud platforms. So for example, um, you wouldn't really want to have uh, single cloud providers low level bug knock your entire production stack out. Not that that would ever happen, but theoretically, right? So there are, uh, for, for folks that want to do that kind of planning and risk mitigation, there's a strong use case for distributing functions or any other Kubernetes workload to multiple clusters that may run in different cloud providers as just one example of a dimension in which hybrid serverless could be a real thing. Okay. If we define serverless as the user or developer experience which allows the developer not to have to be concerned about underlying infrastructure or not have to worry about the scaling of the infrastructure, um, then hybrid serverless would demand that there is somebody who is able to provide that level of experience. And I, th I think that's where uh, the ability to deliver that kind of uh, developer experience kind of starts getting a little more complex because you have to have that same level of network capability of, of storage elasticity uh, or compute uh, on demand uh, as well as number of other orchestration tools that are delivering the very, very same experience. Fortunately, with projects like Kubernetes, like Istio, like Knative, that surface is becoming much smoother and, and starts kind of hide a lot of that underlining um, uh, differentiation between what you can uh, uh, deliver on-premise versus in the cloud. It's still not going to go to the store and going to buy you a server to bring it into your, uh, into your data center. Uh, we're still working on that one. But, uh, but to some degree, the developer would be potentially be able to achieve that same level of experience. So I think it's, it's very much possible. It's going to depend on our ability to, to deliver those core services uh, on-prem and a cloud and hopefully enable that, that portability of workloads that uh, won't uh, force the developer to be concerned about where the, whether they deploy on-prem or in a cloud. Right. Yeah. So, so I will say that no, <laughs> and I will explain what I mean. Okay. Like, I don't know how many people are using serverless right now in production here. None. That's exactly my point, right? The people actually, you know, we're talking about I, but people are not even using serverless. They're going to use serverless most likely in the cloud, which probably be AWS the first one because they are the most mature. And that's what it will be for a long, long, long time until we need to take care of the things. So in my opinion, it's just like, to be fair, we're going really, really far. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, but even with the multiple run times and multiple uh, ways you can run those applications, you don't think then there, nope. there's this so, so we'll tell you what orchestration? I, so right? I will tell you what I think. Maybe it will happen. Way, 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 way on the back. But what you need to know right now is this. The reason people will go to use AWS is because it's really easy. Lambda is easy. You know what? It's integrated seamlessly with every services that you have right now. You can see one place of all the logs and all of the observability. I don't think we're even close to something like that. And I think not talking about right now performance of Lambda, which will be interesting, or serverless, because you need to make sure that it will you know, will act in a very fashion, you know, quick fashion. So I will argue that we're not even close to that. And I will say that if someone is using serverless today, and I know quite a lot of people who's doing it in production, they're using it in the AWS most likely, maybe in Google, but they mainly, mainly using it because they actually really, it's just easy to spin up an application. And it's tied nicely. And in my opinion, we're not even close to this. So. Interesting. Kind of expanding on that, because you, 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 you mentioned application, and I think Mark also talked about serverless, and again, more in a more broad sense, but quite often, at least when I'm talking with customers, people get confused about function as a service and serverless. Maybe can the panel here help us clarify that and talk a little bit about serverless and function as a service, the differences, and should we be concerned about actually breaking the, that, that difference, right? Yeah, so from my, from my point of view, the, I, I really want to say it doesn't matter because I don't care about the buzzwords. I, I tell people, yeah, fine, talk about serverless, talk about functions, so you understand the, the overall concepts in general. 
But really, when you go to look at a piece of technology for hosting your application, look at the functionality, right? Mm -hmm. If it makes sense to break up entire little pieces so that they easily scale, functions might be the way to go. Are you going to do your entire application as a function? As of right now, probably not, right? Do you want something that scales down to zero? Well, then you're starting to get into serverless, right? And, but then is it, if someone says, oh yeah, I do serverless because I scale down to zero, well, okay, that's fine, but what's the cost for, skin, for scaling from zero to one, right? If the cost is 10 minutes, you don't want them to scale down to zero, right? So you gotta look at the complete picture in terms of what they're actually offering you and get away from the buzzwords per se. But, in term, but since you asked, I tend to think of function as a service as more breaking up the application of smaller consumable pieces that are easily scalable, event-driven, typically, given the source code, they'll host it for you, and then serverless is where you add more of the operational aspect, which is scale down to zero, zero cost, and stuff like that. But they are so closely related, I try not to get hung up on the, on the buzzwords between, the, or the difference between those two buzzwords. Mark wants to. Yeah, it's definitely something close to my heart. I, I mean, to a large degree, if we kind of talk about serverless as this developer experience, like I was talking before, about hiding the underlying infrastructure, uh, ability to only pay for what you actually use, um, those are uh, properties that are not unique to compute or function or application. Those are properties that you want to potentially have in your ML platform or in your uh, query or SQL qu platform. Um, so it, to to large degree, my strong feeling is that this is not a compute-only problem. Uh, it's much bigger than function. It's much big, bigger than compute and, and applies to a lot of different uh, disciplines within a technology. Uh, within function itself, I think we have uh, some established notion of what that may particularly mean because of dominance of one, uh, one particular player in that space. But I think developers are getting smarter every day and they expect that same expect experience, the same kind of uh, capabilities from mo multiple different platforms, including now Knative that hopefully we can uh, live up to. I, I think it's important to differentiate just in terms of expectation management where, um, for example, if if you came to Knative and you were looking for an experience uh, similar to Lambda, you wouldn't get that yet. And that's really where I kind of draw the line in terms of, I think of the of function as a service as being an experiential thing primarily, um, whereas serverless is more technology patterns, um, in my own mind, especially focused on software delivery. And you, Serverless is a necessary but insufficient ingredient to get to FAS, where you get that like ability to really focus very, very uh, clearly on just my own business logic and forget about the rest of the things that go into delivering it into production, uh, rolling across versions of it, et cetera. I think one reason that it began with functions as a service was a pure technical one. Those simple stateless pieces of logic, it was easy for a framework to uh, hook in and, and do the auto scaling. Um, long term, or I think it's already um, beginning, um, those serverless qualities like pay per use and then auto scaling will be adopted by all other platforms as well. What maybe remains for functions is the special uh, programming model, like stateless, event-driven, and, and lightweight, which may be suitable for certain use cases. Interesting, no, that makes sense, yeah. And uh, expanding a bit more than on Knative, the, the constructs or the modules we have in Knative, I mean, is it, is it just for serverless? Because, for example, build is a clear one that it's super useful outside of the serverless context as well. I mean, we have been doing that for a while with OpenShift Build, Source to Image, but uh, how, how do you see the usage of parts of Knative outside of the serverless context, or is that, is that even possible? I'm gonna take a, take a stab at this quickly. I, I think when we first start looking in, into Knative itself and we start identifying some of the properties that we would want the platform to have, we quickly realize that those are not something that developers would say, oh, I want for functions, but I don't want it for applications. Uh, I, do I want my applications to spin up from uh, very fast? Yes, I would want that. Do, would I want my application to scale horizontally based on the amount of requests that it receives? Yeah, I want that for functions, I want that for applications. Uh, so to, to a large degree, I don't see that, that differentiation with regards to the type of uh, scope of the application, whether it's just one function or a whole application, but. Uh, I don't think that's unique to that. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree, which is why I'm actually very excited by Knative, because I think, and, and it actually relates to the previous question of you know, what's the difference between FAS and serverless. It's like, I don't care. I just want to host my application. And all the app properties of serverless or functions, they all apply to every single application. Right? I don't want to care about networking. I don't want to have to care about the routing stuff. I don't want to care about auto scaling. Just do it all for me. And if Knative helps get us there with a great user experience so that I don't have to think about it, that's, that's my goal there. And I don't care what you call it. Just give me the functionality I want to get my job done faster. Yeah, anything to that? Hey, yeah, okay. I mean, I would just say that, I mean, I think that it's even, if I remember correctly, it's actually been told, but actually Knative packaging is, was part of something from Cloud Foundry or was related or was donated by Cloud Foundry. Ma? Build packs. Build pack, exactly. So, I mean, basically, if you think about what's going on right now with Knative, it's a very, I mean, there is a lot of similarity of what happened before that with PASS, right? With, with, with Cloud Foundry, for instance, as an example. So then that different. So of course it can be also for container, right? Because I mean, why not? That's what they were doing all this time. So I think that, that definitely all those, those things that anyway, I think it was bored for, for the first place from there can be used. And I think, yeah, I mean, if you think, of, if you think about it, as you said, like KNET should be used for serverless and functions. Okay. Uh, I'm surprised that no one has mentioned eventing as the standout, like, Standalone, yep. Standout thing that is not essentially serverless, right? Like the consumption of events and uh, routing events to functions definitely is part of. But why? Sorry, what's that? Well, but why? Why can't it? Why, why can't it be for for microservices? Uh, I, that I'm trying in my very long-winded way to say that it can be right, yeah. uh, it, in the sense that. It, eventing in particular is is not new, right? Like the and what the community has done there since ver version zero one to zero two is just phenomenal. So I'm looking forward to kind of seeing that evolve uh, to to a large degree. That's going to drive the future of the platform uh, because that's what developer looking for. Developers are looking for. So one of the things that I'm especially curious to see is uh, uh, I have two two components. One is the like serverless and FAS, and I, I'm really looking forward to seeing in the next year uh, FAS offerings that are based upon Knative because you know that's the the last 20% uh, to get to the experiential things that you would expect from a Lambda, for example. Getting there is an interesting journey. Uh, the the Kubernetes nerd in me is also extremely interested to see. Uh, how we can make progress in Kubernetes. Uh, and, and for example, we talked about uh, scaling performance, right? We've already uh, uh, had cause to find at least one thing that I can't remember the pull request number now to Kubernetes, but I don't think anybody really cares to increase the performance of scaling up from zero. Um, that's one dimension that I think will be really interesting to see, like if we can drive it, performance improvements back into Kubernetes during our work on Knative. Uh, and then there's another component where, uh, going back to my like pet area of interest uh, or sub area of interest in eventing, where one of the, the novel things about Knative eventing is that you define your own event source, right? And that gets you back into the kind of like cloud native application uh, facet of life in Kubernetes where I'm expecting to see a lot of event sources get produced and managing them and uh, making them work together and just giving the Kubernetes and Knative communities time to digest exactly how do we slice and dice these APIs for event sources seems like it might uh, have some really fruitful outcomes there. So um, speaking of eventing, um, today already this uh, cluster federation was the topic sometimes. I think that could also be quite interesting uh, for Knative eventing because events usually don't start at the uh, edge of a cluster and do not end there. So uh, you, you usually want to uh, look at that event flow uh, maybe across clusters or also across or with regard to outside sources, and uh, that could be interesting to combine cluster federation and eventing. It's funny you mention that, since I lead a team at Red Hat that works on Kubernetes federation. Um, 
during my uh, my break time this year, I'm really looking forward over the holidays to uh, to getting Federation to deploy Knative resources, which is I I can just pitch you now. I will be able to do this without writing any code, uh, and I'm really looking forward to messing around with. So, deploying K native uh, services. Yeah, I really think that they want to go to lunch. So I will do that very quick. But here's what I'm thinking, right? Why container actually catch? It's catch because the benefit of actually using container was huge versus using legacy application. So first of all, in order to serverless to become something, in my opinion, we need to see a huge benefit of someone to use that. I don't know that it's there yet. That's number one. Number two. OK, so you want to use serverless. So you want to use microservices. But what about? the other stuff that you're using already. So people using more legacy, people want to use microservices. Now there is uh, serverless. And in my opinion, the problem is that it shouldn't be or, it should be end. And this is, a, by the way, I will just pitch, this is what my company is doing, so <laughs> look at our product glue. But that's exactly the purpose. What if we can take the legacy application and actually extend it to microservice and serverless and add the functionality there where it makes sense? Use the right architecture for the right problem to solve. And that's why I always say, so the future, I don't, th I don't think that it's matter if it's K-native or something else. I think what is matter is that for those people to use it, and this is what I'm really hoping that will happen, we need to make it easy for them and tie it all the way to their legacy application. And that's what we're hoping to do. Yeah. I think last comment from, from Mark. So, yeah. I mean, I think that underscores the kind of the right way of thinking about it. I'm hoping that next year or two years from now when we meet in a conference like this, services just assume as de facto use, usage patterns. You as a developer really should not have to worry about a lot of those concerns. Uh, I know uh, we at Google would like to deliver, uh, already delivering set of uh, serverless functions, but to some degree we want you to come to a platform as a developer and not have to make a choice for, uh, as the number one step, am I gonna be building a function or am I gonna be building application? Exactly. I should be just able to write my application in a, and expect a lot of the things that we're looking from serverless to be just there by default. This is exactly why we were so interested in Knative, because we saw that, again, I, I don't, I don't want to choose, right? I can do functions, applications, app, microservices. I can have my integrations with event sources, legacy code, or, or new event sources. That, that's why I think we were so interested in, in that project. I'd like to thank the panel to join us. Thank you all for staying with us. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you.